Hello, good evening, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for coming here to a great event. Uh, I'm actually Angel asked me to be here to, to work, so I'm here. Um, this is uh, this is a distinguished missile fellowship, uh, which uh, is a, a, a generous donation uh, from the Mock family. Uh, some of the mocks are at the farm. Uh, and this is uh, this fellowship uh, bring to Hong Kong U uh, all the distinguished visitors. And this started in 2008 with a very generous donation. And we have, uh, I believe, we have bring in, we brought in uh, the first uh, Peter Goodfellow, who is uh, a world-renowned uh, biological scientist. And now we have a second world-renowned uh, scholar. Uh, Angela is going to introduce Helen, uh, who is a good friend of Hong Kong U and old friends. And uh, the donor family, um, of Atiu, and this is Bob Atiu, is sitting in the background. Uh, we want to show our gratitude. Um, and we are old friends. We, we, we haven't seen for almost 40 years. Uh, and I, I enjoy seeing you and uh, talk to you afterward. So I want to again express uh, this uh, the Vox family's great contribution to Hong Kong U, bringing in the top scientists and the top scholars from around the world to come and meet with students, the most important thing. Uh, so please, uh, students, uh, take this opportunity and uh, talk to Professor Helen Seo afterward or in the next uh, few days or weeks. Uh, this is uh, doing it for, for the better of our colleagues and students. So I'll stop at this and then ask uh, Angela to introduce us speaker. Again, uh, welcome to Hong Kong U and I hope you enjoy this uh, seminar. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Roman. Um, it is my great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Helen Siu, uh, Helen, my good friend. Um, uh, Helen, I think, has uh, two hats. Uh, I think most of us here uh, know her to be a distinguished uh, scholar, um, a very um, accomplished anthropologist at Yale University. Um, maybe she would like her herself to be called a historical anthropologist, um, uh, working mostly on society in South China, focusing especially on cultural processes, identity formation, rural and urban transformation, and so on. And she has, um, uh, she's the author and, and editor of a great number of important articles and books, which I'm not going to list here, uh, that have tremendous impact on China, China studies and Hong Kong studies. I think she is notably known as one of the key uh, builders of what we now call the South China School, the Huanan Xue Pai, or uh, for the less respectful, the Huanan Bang. <laughs> uh, uh, who, who studies Chinese society um, with a historical anthropological um, uh, approach, meaning uh, using uh, both um, very substantial archival materials and uh, intensive um, uh, ethnographic fieldwork. I think the other main builder is here, David Ford, an old uh, collaborator of Helen. Um, and um, so uh, this uh, Huanan Xue Pai, as you may know, has a tremendous following in and outside China. And Helen, uh, as a distinguished scholar, uh, other than her uh, intellectual achievements, uh, is also much appreciated for her important contribution to tertiary education in Hong Kong, as she was um, overseas a member of the RGC and UGC for almost 10 years. Um, but because the second hat that she wears may be not too obvious for some of you here, what I mean is she's also a formidable institution builder. Um, she, um, it, it was she who, who established the Hong Kong Institute for the Humanities and Social Sciences, uh, which organizes this talk today. Um, more than 12 years ago in the year 2001, a bit on the margin of the university, 
uh, as she planned it, the Institute began as uh, a very unique and dynamic model that promotes um, interdisciplinary collaborative um, projects involving scholars from Hong Kong, China, uh, overseas, uh, you know, America, and Europe. And uh, for more than 10 years, uh, Helen single-handedly um, built and developed the Institute uh, at the same time having a full-time job here as, as a professor. So, um, um, so we are all very grateful for, for Helen. And, and then, uh, 10 years later, uh, she fully convinced the university of the value of this institute as a viable, viable platform for humanities studies, for quality humanities research and training. And that's when I took up the position of uh, Wutan, the first full-time director of the institute. So I think it's really Helen's vision of what um, humanities education should be like her um, determination to make her dream come true, and her reserved commitment to Hong Kong, where she was born and grew up, that made this miracle possible. Um, and, um, and after uh, the Institute was more fully integrated into the university, she continues to contribute greatly to the Institute by, you know, um, in program building and fundraising. And I, I, I cannot imagine how she manages to do all this while you know, having a full-time job in Yale. Uh, I, sometimes I think she doesn't sleep a lot because I can get Skype calls from her in the middle of the day uh, when she's supposed to be in bed in New Haven. So that's how she works. And for this time, for instance, she flew all the way uh, from Yale in the middle of the semester. Uh, to give this talk, talk and to do a couple of important things for the Institute and she will fly back to Yale um, next week. So that's how seriously Helen wears her two hats. And um, Helen is also very adventurous in her research. Um, in recent years, she has moved to other areas of the world, especially China, in, uh, notably India, Middle East, and yes, Africa where she took a few of us with her last year. It was the most eye-opening experience. But um, South China, I think, is always her love, her first love, and last one. And um, today, she will share with us her uh, findings on uh, recent urban development, urban transformation in Guangdong province. Um, her research, I'm sure, will demonstrate uh, her 40 years of very solid ethnographic experience and theoretical uh, construction. So please join, join me in welcoming uh, Helen. farmers 
into the reviving market terms and thought that I was going to see the private sector emerging, but of course I found a state revolution. In the 90s, I watched the 100 million plus migrants moving, rushing into the cities to fill factories and construction sites that I found a little urbanity. In the past decade, I have tracked Chinese entrepreneurs on routes to the Middle East and to Africa. But instead of neoliberal market flows, I found very dominant late socialist agendas. So coming back to the rapidly urbanized Pearl River Delta, I keenly feel um, the impact of the region's global engagement. So no one would doubt, I think, today that in the 21st century, it is facing a very remarkable urban transformation worldwide. Um, in, in, in 1800, actually 3% of the world's population lived in cities. But in 2008, that figure reached over 50%. These transformations are most visible in uh, Asia's uh, hubs, of an Asian Renaissance, I would say, today. Uh, eight of the world's mega cities, that, that is, cities with over um, um, 10 million population, uh, are in Asia, eight out of the 10. Uh, and in post reform China, and they were very conscious of its rising powers and global rise, I would say, city building has reached the intensity, the scale, and the audacity of another revolution. So, um, so who are these major players and winners or losers? Who are being impeded and who are being excluded? What cultural lifestyles are visible and how are these processes intertwined with nationalistic aspirations, with social divisions, and with co political conflict? So what analytical insights can we gain at this historical juncture? So these are some of the issues I think are very much in the minds of Asian scholars across the disciplines. So for me, who started, if you will, in the, in the late 70s, China is you know, obviously almost unrecognizable today. I still remember that saying that in the 70s, Everything was red, but life was colorless. But of course, today, life is extremely colorful. Um, and, but the redness has not gone completely. So um, in the 2009, if we figure it out, over 150 million migrants have gone to the cities for manufacturing, construction, and service jobs. Um, then land is an issue. How are cities accommodating these people? So as land is rapidly re revalued, um, um, restructuring urban space to accommodate them um, and, and to accommodate a new market demands, I think has dominated government agenda. So one wonders how local society negotiates with these very powerful state interests. In the past years, I have focused my attention on urban villages, on claves, basically on claves in Guangzhou, to see how the city is reassembled as it absorbed surrounding villages. So I looked into key stakeholders, several groups, uh, you know, officials and city planners, um, real estate developers, urbanites, migrants, and also what I call these urban villages. And how have, you know, the question is, how have they used both instrumental and symbolic means to remake spatial hierarchies of power and economy? So this is something that I've been sort of chasing after in the last eight years or so in Guangzhou. So I'm particularly interested in the in the uh, circumstances of the villagers. Uh, they are living at the edges of cities, uh, and in this case in Guangzhou, and they face an urban tsunami, if I may use the term. Um, their farmlands pressed against highways, 
um, luxury apartments, East Asian communities, business districts, and uh, shopping malls. Evictions and de demolitions uh, take, take place daily while their rather cheap houses are now sought after by migrant uh, workers. Although the physical boundaries of their living spaces are quite porous uh, in relation to the city, um, city officials drew a, I mean, draw a very hard line uh, by labeling them um, urban villages, and target them, I mean, target the villages, uh, the villages for demolition. Farming is no longer a prime livelihood, but villages often cling onto their very rural lifestyles and collective land holding as if to go against the tide to become urban. And so for an observer like me, this is, this is very counterintuitive. In the past, villages um, eagerly sought urban hukou, a household registration and employment, but in return for their uh, um, agricultural land, um, especially when they are, you know, the land is being requisitioned for state projects. So villages were more than willing to give up their, uh, their land for an urban hukou. Today, the law allows these villages to have used rights uh, for their land for quite a long time, some up to 70 years. Um, early eviction, by law, um, should be compensated. Um, the question is how. Um, some stories are not very rosy. Uh, Yu Jian Rong, a colleague from Beijing, uh, a scholar who worked on social protest, reports that between 1980 to 2003, 13% of China's um, uh, total cultivable, cultivable land was appropriated by state agencies, uh, affecting about 50 to 66 million villages. Although the number of their grieved is large, their subsequent relocation and identity rupture um, have prevented any kind of effective collective action. And local governments have faced desperate resistance from those with grievances. Um, the, the scenes of eviction victims igniting themselves on rooftops, uh, or protesters, or rights lawyers being beaten by thugs, um, are circulated with quite an intense story uh, via the internet. Things like the male households uh, have long become a rather popular symbol for those who would dig in their heels. Um, so what about the post reforms of China in this juncture of this land revaluation? South China has witnessed um, much of these tensions. Uh, to name a few, I think uh, many of us here know, the Taishi uh, incident in 2005, and then of course, the in 2011. The liberalization of Guangdong's regional economy started very early. Its proximity to Hong Kong, proximity to Hong Kong and Macau uh, meant very diverse resources and market experiences. Um, they provided steady employment for tens of millions of migrant workers, uh, technicians, and small traders. It just, if you take um, um, uh, 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 in 2001, I think already by then, um, about 35% of the inter-regional migrants ended up in Guangdong. And that's, you know, if you, if you use 1.2, uh, uh, um, 1.2, how do I say Right. Okay. okay, but 35, anyway, it's a huge number. <laughs> but 35% uh, of them ended up in Guangdong, and most of them ended up in Dunghua um, to feed into the factories. Um, and so, and then of course, with the rising income, um, the, the new middle class in Guangdong also enjoyed high levels of, dis of disposable income. It's actually in 2009, it was second in China. Uh, right after Jiangsu, in terms of 
the amount of FDI that is from direct investment, and that fourth in disposable income after Beijing, Shanghai, Shenzhen. So there's a lot of wealth, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of mobility, and a lot of outsiders rushing in to, to the cities. And so revenue um, from state and private enterprises offer very, uh, a, a huge range of services and goods for a very affluent population. Uh, and that encouraged municipalities to build very ambitious infrastructure um, and also to, um, for these offi office officials to see them as the forefront, um, at the forefront of the nation's modernization. So everyone, I would say, in the last few decades um, has been in a mad rush uh, to acquire a share of the profits, which until recently, I think, were almost unimaginable. So there is this very mad rush um, for southern China for this capturing this new, new kind of energies. And so let me just uh, show a few slides uh, just to to sort of to put what I'm going to talk about in context. So, you know, at the very macro level, we can see China as world factory. And historians like here, I know David Moore, Ching Bao, and a few of us, the, uh, the uh, no, Elizabeth Sin too, you know, sort of members of the South China gang. Uh, of course, in the 18th century, Guangzhou was already world factory. I mean, considering all the China trade, all the goods that were sent to Europe, to the Middle East, to to the U.S. are all produced by these, uh, uh, by these hand, handicrafts uh, uh, workers in Guangzhou. So, but in the 20th century, uh, uh, late 20th century, definitely Guangzhou um, experienced another uh, uh, of China's uh, uh, being work factory. And it's possible because of several macro factors, capital, global capital flows for sure, and. Although we would say that the Maoist era was a very, very politically devastating one, uh, 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 experience for many of the uh, populations, but in general, one, have to, one, well, one has to agree that there's a relatively uh, um, you know, uh, uh, sort of a basic level of health care, of education, and of family change that can democratize. The, the, the family structures to release uh, at least women labor uh, uh, in the post-49 decades. So by the time China uh, uh, embarked on these uh, um, liberalizing reforms, it has a rather educated, healthy, uh, and mobile workforce. And sure enough, um, the urban-rural divide that was in, in, in place since 1958 suddenly released a huge number of, and a huge amount of cheap labor. And so all of that makes China very much as a world factory, very quickly. And then how would China's world factory affect the regional economy of South China? So there is, as I, I said earlier, um, a regional modernity and very rapid urbanization. Uh, FDI, factory regimes, the South China miracle that CK Lee and Hun Kun, I, two of my very close colleagues, have talked about. Um, there is, as we said, the rising middle class with disposable income, uh, huge infrastructure built for these people, and then, of course, very sharp inequalities between the, the, the migrants and the, the, the further rights. What about Guangzhou? Uh, Guangzhou is uh, South China's major cities. Uh, it, it's, as a city, it was rushing fast forward with, with historical baggage. Uh, it has tremendous media exposure. Now, I, I still remember, even back in the late 80s, I, I was in a market town studying, uh, uh, doing, doing <coughs> the, the market town transformation. And quite a few of my informants' homes, you know, when I walked in, it was very familiar. Of course, it was more like the scenes in the soap operas in the Hong Kong TVE, you know, <laughs> so they were, you know, the fish, the fish, you know, uh, the fish tanks. I mean, it was just, you know, in some stairs. Uh, I mean, it was just exactly, you know, the kind of uh, uh, um, uh, 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 copying 
uh, of lifestyles. So people were very, very familiar with Hong Kong's lifestyle. And of course, you know, people, even villages, know what, what the value of real estate is. So I mean, it's very, very important um, to have a rather media savvy and informed population uh, across all classes of southern China, purely because of Hong Kong television and media. Um, but of course, there's also volatile market. Um, and all of that compromised somewhat the state power or the municipal uh, state power that Beijing or Shanghai as cities would enjoy. Guangzhou does not have that kind of total state power. Um, um, and at the same time, Guangzhou is one, has rather limited land supply. Uh, it's hemmed in by Foshan, Fasan on one side, and then also Shenzhen, Shenzhen on the other. So there's tremendous competition uh, for extent for land for expansion uh, among these municipalities within uh, the South China region. Um, so um, what are the major stakeholders, and how how are their energies um, together built up a very very different urban landscape? So I'm just going to go through the first three groups very quickly because I want to concentrate on the urban villages, the fourth uh, category, because the other three are very well studied. So modern infrastructure. So for these, that's the hardware of official vanity. So Guangzhou, sometimes if you look from afar, it looks like London. <laughs> Beautiful, clean, tidy, uh, um, but lifeless. I mean, I still remember, you know, to make gold and before and others would be able to tell me what the Pearl River was like in the centuries before, but now is completely cleansed. Um, it's good to look, but probably there's not much energy left while in the water. And then, of course, infrastructure. This is city town, um, boulevards with six lane highways. You know, from the 70s to the 80s, when the roads were basically filled with uh, jeeps and trucks, now these are all private cars and you know, sedans and SUVs and you know, and the BMWs and so on and so forth. Subway, um, beautiful subway systems. Actually, I would need to ask Alfred whether these subways were built by Hong Kong. No, they're all built by. China, yeah, so, uh, I see, but they, they look pretty nice. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, you know, subway system. I remember showing this uh, slide a few years back for my Hong Kong students, and they thought that they were in Hong Kong until they saw the station up on the top. It's very clear. It was China, and then other, other very, you know, a very nice. Uh, um, Infrastructure. <laughs> That's my sister. <laughs> <laughs> you excused Esther. <laughs> but anyway, um, the you know other very uh, modern infrastructure. This is the Guangzhou's uh, um, um, uh, concert hall. But the I interesting thing for this is that there's very mixed images. On, on in the front, you still see the the image of. A, a, a revolutionary soldier type, you know, I know it's not very fun, but you know, it goes. But then stuck in a corner in the back, um, I see it, I yeah, is this very postmodern Chopin, uh, um, you know, playing madly on his piano. Um, and then, of course, not just infrastructure, um, national spectacles. I mean, every city was in a, again, in a rush to try to show off and perform in the world a uh, national uh, spectacle for, for Guangzhou. It was the Asian Games uh, um, recently. Uh, so I was trying to fight it off. Um, so all of these, you need urban space. How will the city need urban space? Um, the first will be the historical rallies. You know, they went very quickly. I still remember a few years ago, Yu uh, Guanang and a few of us were there um, in the Dashui Chang area. Um, 
this is uh, uh, something that was created by uh, uh, the party sec provincial party secretary, secretary Jean, de, Jean de Jean at the time. When he took over uh, uh, Bordeaux, he decided to put a lot of the university campuses in one place and called that the Dutch region. And so uh, they built highways, they built very, very uh, lifeless infrastructure at the time, and then they squeezed these beautiful historical buildings right under the highways. So that's what we saw. Making space, and still it's better than demolishing them. So these were gone very quickly, right in the city. Um, and then, of course, modern infrastructure, that is for the Asia Games, and that's one of the stadium. I was taking a picture from the Wuchang uh, from the very historic uh, uh, um, uh, building that was built in 1387, think, during the Ming Dynasty, called the Zhenghai overlooking the waterfront. There, you know, it was very clear that um, modern sports national spectacle was pressing against its borders. But it's not only infrastructure was making, uh, 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 made the need for space, you see migrants rushing in. Um, and that's, uh, I would still say, uh, not all of them, um, uh, but a large part, a large number of them of uh, the underclass in China's modernity, and they share the same city space. Um, the clothing markets catering to a lot of the developing countries. Um, so these are just clothing markets right in the middle of the city. Uh, that's the old train station uh, with uh, migrants waiting for the train to go home for holidays. Um, you know, other you know, new uh, migrants here and there. Uh, but then what about the middle class? They also share the same urban space and they play catching up with the world and with their own lifestyles. Very luxury housing apartments, um, more um, a thriving real estate uh, business. These are um, I think these are inside, these are like, um, layers and layers of um, um, very luxurious restaurants. And then of course the services. So, um, and, and the services need offices, so office buildings need to be built too. Uh, malls. This is the new Hai um, uh, I don't know what it's called in English. Swire. I bet you haven't seen pumps in China, but they are you know, pumps in uh, China. And that's the, the, the part of the Tai Wu, the spire. Anybody knows the English name for this? But there's a brand new uh, 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 um, shopping mall. And of course, cars, luxury cars, and huge luxury cars. So on top of that, you know, for malls and offices and, 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 and communities, you know, there's also places for the rising middle class to build cultural capital. International schools, parks for uh, wedding pictures, museums, um, I, I know, to train up um, the younger generation with culture. I don't know what that means, but they didn't have. Um, but you know, the past isn't completely gone, even if, if they are remade, even in the artistic expressions. And then, of course, building more and more villas and, and gated communities. I remember this was taken a few years ago, and as I was pretending to be a potential buyer, even though I don't look it, I don't look it, I was faking it, um, and. Um, and I was looking over across the river and saw the brick factories over there. And I said, oh, oh dear. You know, and, and at the same time, there was a busload of, uh, of um, um, potential buyers coming in. To me, they are not what Joe people, that, you know, probably from out of the pro outside the province. And I was, you know, talking about, you know, Look, do you see? You know, do you see all those things over there? And 
I just got a very surprised look as if to say, well, what's your problem, lady? <laughs> so when they were uh, pressing against rural land as well. Um, so that just a little bit of, of Joe's demographics before I read it. I just want to skip this very quickly. Um, there's a very, and as a city, it has some very rapid rate of population growth. Um, 57% in the, in the decade before, and then 24.8% in this recent decade. So it's, it's a, a very, very uh, 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 huge population growth. And then it's spatially very unevenly, unevenly, uh, uh, unevenly uh, distributed. Over 60% in the core old uh, 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 city district. Um, and then, as I said before, uh, um, and, and then also a lot of them are from the outside. So in, in a sense, this is, you know, if you think about uh, uh, Guangzhou and its surrounding uh, uh, you know, sort of cities that it has sort of taken over, uh, but the most of the population is concentrated here. And, and as, as you will know, um, for the following slides, I'm going to talk about all these urban villages all along here, all around here. This is where I will concentrate. So, where to look for space? And um, ever since the 90s, the city has been trying to uh, um, devise new policies to absorb the countryside in fair and you know, accelerated rate. Uh, but by 2009, I think the city was quite desperate, and so the San Zhao Gai, the San Zhao became very, very important. Uh, 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 as a policy. Um, what are the three old? Well, uh, old industrial and factory sites, old city neighborhoods, and then uh, urban villages. And for urban villages, the Changdong Chun, they, you know, as uh, the Changdong Chun became the major target uh, for this kind of Sanjiu uh, Gai um, 138 of them to be transformed in 10 years, 53 in the, in the next five years, and actually 15 of them have already been targeted immediately for transformation. Um, generally, the city uh, 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 officials maintain a rather linear view of development. Um, let me just talk about that a little bit first. Um, so what do I mean by very linear? view of urban development. So official, uh, the officials, first they see the Changzhou Chun as basically something sort of remnants of the past, <coughs> that they need to be modernized. They, they are dirty, they are chaotic, they are, are, are unhealthy, they are um, uh, uh, places uh, full of crime um, and, and so on. So, so in a sense for the officials, they see that as, 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 as the Changdong Chun as something that really got to be cleansed. <coughs> uh, but, uh, but sociologists, uh, particularly from uh, China, um, uh, Li Beilin, for example, and his group has actually argued that these village enclaves are not rural remnants. Uh, but in fact, they are new village communities. Uh, a, a, a geographer at Berkeley, uh, Xin Yutan, actually characterizes uh, the phenomenon of Chang Chun Chun as village, new village corporatism in response uh, 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 to a uh, new local state making. Uh, others see these neighborhoods as even providing a function, seeing that so long as China remains work factory, and Dongguan continues to attract migrant laborers, then these urban villages uh, perform a function of producing cheap housing. Um, and then uh, some uh, um, colleagues, uh, younger ones, uh, who's inspired by my colleague in, 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 at Yale, Jim Scott, talking about resistance and weapons of the weak, so they see some of these villages as 
um, as enclaves for, uh, 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 for some kind of uh, resistance uh, to, to this state agenda. And so, um, so they may be illegal, but you know, they may feel that they are deliberately illegal to thumb their nose at the, at the state. So um, whatever we, you know, however we are analytically trying to, to think of them, um, the original rural backwardness, it's always assumed, and then, um, uh, um, and then this official narrative of a linear urban progress is seldom challenged. And so let me just show a few more slides of the conclusion, just to give you the sense of why officials think that they got to, they got to be demolished and cleansed. So uh, actually, my colleague in Chung San Dao Liu Zhuwei, a main historian, he would say this would have been a very similar scene of the Pearl River Delta during the Ming Dynasty, when villages were reclaiming the, the sea uh, to make uh, them into holders, just like Amsterdam, I would say, and then gradually from holders into very rich rice fields. Uh, so that's Pearl River Delta um, as it is today in the outer reaches. But then this is a very typical Changchun Chun. You can see a very substandard cheap housing built by villages, rented out to uh, um, uh, 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 migrants and they're surrounded by modern office buildings. And then of course, so they had village ponds and so now that you know, these ponds become just dead, polluted water. Um, I still remember during 2003, I didn't realize that then, then you know, I came back from the youth of the States and hearing that there, there were SARS brewing and I didn't realize that I headed right into one of these children and um, and people were telling me that oh you shouldn't be going to there, there you know and so I mean I could imagine that they were quite a bit of a health hazard at the time. This is taken 2013, still there. They're being demolished, but some of them are still there uh, in the process of you know, negotiating the terms for demolition and compensation. <coughs> everything uh, for, for children. But the inside of the Changdong Chen, you know, I took these uh, slides a few years ago, um, <coughs> and, and there's always a village gate. Um, you still see an itinerant barber, and then on the, on the right you see um, um, some ethnic uh, uh, um, women uh, from northern Guangdong probably. Uh, um, they come to sometimes to look for uh, um, uh, casual work, sometimes they beg uh, during the winters, particularly. Inside, you know, people have heard about these aksa I don't know, you know, they are so close to each other that uh, residents can actually you know, walk out to the balconies and then you know, shake hands. Mm -hmm. And then what I was noticing is that all the, all the restaurants, you know, they're very much non from like the Hunan, the Sichuan, the, basically they're serving the, the uh, cuisine for the migrant tenants. And then of course, supposedly crime, I mean, every time, you know, it's just like reading the people's daily, you know, whenever there are banners saying that you should not do this, that means it's all there. Um, so <laughs> down below, you already see, you know, uh, hostels renting by the day, or sometimes even by the hour. You know. And then, this is, uh, you know, just, you know, you're walking into these villages, so, you know, take care, be, beware of crime. Um, and then, of course, you also see advertisements for asking for, um, for young women workers for particular kind of professions. This is a village, um, um, head, you know, cutting hair. This is a real one. This is probably not a real one, so don't walk in to ask for a haircut. <laughs> and then there are others, you know, there's a lot of factories there, um, small factories, and they, they, they turn over quite a bit. 
uh, migrant workers waiting for daily assignments for work. These are taken a few years ago, so a lot of the Changchun, uh, these you don't see anymore because they really have been cleansed. Um, but, you know, you, you do see migrants continuing to come to register whenever they come in uh, uh, to find a place to live. Uh, but then, at the same time, very interestingly, the, the, the villagers themselves were taking um, a very keen interest in creating their own real estate enterprises. Again, this was taken in 2006. Um, I was already observing um, some of the villagers uh, using their collective land, uh, not selling it to the government or, 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 or building uh, old houses. Instead, they collectively, uh, these are the, the collective uh, uh, um, uh, um, uh, houses and then they will pool their resources and land and they build houses for themselves and then they rent out some of the plants too. So they live in town and then the poorer, older houses they will rent to the lowest of the migrant workers. Uh, they also have collective enterprises. These are business spaces um, renting out to you know, other uh, units um, to get a collective income. So even then, you, you already see villages together, not as individuals, but as villages um, uh, entering into uh, um, uh, modern real estate. You know? So anyway, for me, sort of looking at all these things and, and seeing that many of the literature assumes a, a rather linear uh, view, I would like to, you know, for the last part of this talk, uh, would like to, to give you a rather non-linear view of China's urban revolution. Um, I think few of, of, of our colleagues have fully, have fully tackled the village's strategic move to use past disadvantages to show up their future. What, I mean, what do I mean by past disadvantages? Well, disadvantages in the Maoist era of being, if I may use the word rather strongly, incarcerated, grounded in their own rural land and not being allowed to move into the cities and so on and so forth. But today, when the city, when the city just sort of come into their own, their world, uh, how do they, uh, how do they uh, tackle that? And so there's a lot of very strategic moves to use precisely their collective land ownership to then gain the market and gain the, the new state policies uh, for modern transformation. And so, um, in, you know, what I see is that some of these villages are very actively um, deepening their rural uko, rural statuses, and their rights, or collective rights. Um, and then they re reinvent uh, or re reinforce um, um, some of their um, cultural belongings um, based on rather fragmented, uh, uh, lost cultural fragments. Um, and I think in, in that sense, uh, today, they are probably no different um, from some of the farmers way back in the countryside erecting temples um, for past revolutionary leaders like Mao and Zhou Enlai and Buddha um, to negotiate with the demons of reform uh, in order to gain some kind of economic security for their children. So I was sort of noticing that, um, uh, um, that these villages uh, um, are having very contradictory emotions. Um, they're juggling with very entrenched bureaucratic inter interventions uh, and also very volatile market. But in the process, they have unintentionally created some very lively urban assemblage, a, a, a peculiar sonia, if I may use Jim Scott's word, you know, a kind of enclave that, that have a, a kind of a rawness, a, a, a kind of backwardness, backwardness quote-unquote, uh, um, in these metropolitan states. That, you know, these enclaves are precariously poised between past victimization and future fortunes. So in a word, these villages are gaining big time real estate and see it as their second liberation. So that's 
sort of a, a, a kind of a, um, a, a, a theme that I'd like to pursue. This is still a very half-baked idea. I've been talking to Jim Scott at Yale about this. I said, you know, Jim, um, you, you, you talk about Sonia. Well, what is a Sonia? You know, actually, Jim did not invent the word Sonia. It was, in, in, it was coined by another colleague, um, uh, a, a colleague of mine, a friend of mine from Amsterdam, uh, uh, William Van Schendel. He looked at um, a, a, um, a, a, a massive area of very rugged terrain in highland South and Southeast Asia, uh, quite beyond state control, and called that Sonia. Sonia is a sort of a Burmese Tibetan kind of word, meaning so meaning remote, Nia means people. So in a sense, it, it's a zone, very large, interracial, which which it has been a kind of stateless, you know, that is out of state control. And Jim actually <coughs> twist, you know, twist the term a little bit to say that well these zones were not just naturally abandoned by, by state societies because uh, uh, they were hard to get to, but instead, you, you know, these are zones of refuge, zones, what, what he calls shatter zones, um, that um, both hill people and the plains people would deliberately escape into to make themselves illegible for state intervention so that they escaped into these zones um, and turned themselves rural. Uh, and, um, and so in a sense, that's what Sonia, I mean, it, it, you know, I, I'm doing a lot of injustice uh, to Jim's uh, concept, but this is just sort of something at that level of abstraction. I've been playing uh, um, with his concept and talking to him. Actually, I showed him, I showed him a paper that I've written uh, for a journal and you know, he seems to be quite uh, taken by, the, by another twist. I, because I asked him, I said, you know, Jim, you know, you know um, what we would like to find, Sonia, is that you can find it in the heart of a CBD in a global city like Guangzhou. You don't have to go to the highlands in Burma and, and India <coughs> to find them. <coughs> so, so in a sense, what I'm trying to say is that in the heart of a CBD, a central business district in Guangzhou, there's no friction of terrain or no friction of distance that both uh, Jim, Scott, and, and, and William Van Shendel would think. But in fact, inside these urban villages is just as illegible. And these farmers are now using, deliberately turning themselves rural, uh, reinforcing their rural statuses and their collective land uh, to then profit from the real estate boom. So, so let me just go quickly now onto the last bit um, to talk about how they did it. So, so for the, for the um, I, I, I used the case of a village, um, um, a, 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 a urban village, and I call this Lili. Uh, it, it, it's, just, it, it's a it's a big name. Um, um, uh, but Lili village. How Lili village becomes CBD. So Guangzhou city moves east. So you know, I'm sure a lot of you know uh, uh, the the Tianhe uh, Qinghe district is very much the eastern part of Guangzhou. You know, which has now become very very much the new city. Um, what the Lili villages have done is to recapture the past um, uh, by, by setting a very high price for their rural hukou uh, and setting very high price for their collective land. And now they would say they use that to reconfigure space. Um, so they exchange space horizontally to vertical space. So rather than cultivating fields, they gave up a lot of their fields. Instead, they worked with developers to build blocks of apartments, luxury apartments for them. Each family would have quite a few, you know, 10, 12, 15, up to 25. Um, and then, so they exchange horizontal space for vertical space. And then they will then have used rights collectively uh, for these um, luxury apartments. 
So they said, uh, you know, Ganti, Gamu Ganti, right? So they no longer cultivate fields. Um, and then how do they maintain themselves as a collective in this kind of uh, uh, frag, frag, fragmented uh, uh, urban environment? So they reinvent cultural um, heritage and solidarity and then make themselves, I would say, Maoist landlords in the post -Maoist. So, So I'm going to flip very fast because I'm running out of time. Um, um, so this is uh, part of the CBD. I, you know, office buildings, new boulevards, um, residential uh, luxury flats for the professionals. Um, and then once you turn into the village, this was the village before it was demolished in 2008. So we walked in and it was a completely different world from what you just saw right against this wall. <coughs> still old town, old uh, ancestral halls. Uh, it's along the little creek. And then you see uh, little stores. They're all uh, uh, um, actually uh, owned and, and managed by uh, um, outsiders. These are not villagers. And of course, these are the migrant workers uh, um, um, having lunch, um, you know, migrant workers who live there or who work there nearby. And then the big moment came in 2006. Um, a combination of developers uh, um, in Guangzhou and a Hong Kong developer actually worked out a deal with the, um, with the, um, with the, with the village um, to buy up all, all the remaining land of the, of the village. You know, in 1994, the village already gave up probably 90% of its land. Uh, for the city in return for some compensation. Each person per capita, they got 70,000 yuan per person. And they used the remaining land in the village to build these six-story houses to then rent them out. But in 2006, actually, the, the, the three developers together, uh, one after another, contracted um, to take over, actually, all the land uh, in return uh, the developers will build 37 blocks of luxury built uh, house um, uh, apartments for these villages, each of them about 40 stories high. Um, and so, so from 2008 on, um, the villages were dispersed in different parts of the city uh, um, for some rental um, apartments to live while their entire village was raised to the ground. Um, the, the, the ancestral halls, the temples, everything. Um, and so there it was, you know, moving time. So they actually watched their houses being you know, demolished over the year. It's amazing, you know, they, they were there under the highway, um, watching their houses being demolished and, you know, playing chess and you know, sort of living in, in the construction sites. I mean, this was quite extraordinary, extraordinary to see that. Um, but there they were. So that's what they were promised. 37, uh, um, you know, uh, 37 blocks of these luxury housing, you know, uh, um, right on the riverfront. And sure enough, uh, this is a model. This is real. Um, and so, I mean, it, it was built in record time. And so by the, by the, but, in the meantime, while these apartments were being built, um, they also the villagers were also recycling uh, um, the, the religion and their lineage culture. And so, what did they do? So they rebuilt, um, you know, because their they old uh, tsitao were all gone. So they rebuilt the tsitao. They lumped the, all the tsitao together. There's like five surnames. And so it becomes a Tsitang Chu. And this is a completely new way of thinking about Tsitang. Because before, you know, the Tsitang would have its own spatial and, and cultural and social, you know, speciality. And now it's just all lumped together. Um, and then, you know, when it was Hoi Guang, so you know, people had a great time. Um, and then they would have 
uh, uh, ceremonies and weddings and all that uh, in the Titan. Uh, and then temples. And so again, they did not put the temples together. First, they actually built the one and the most important one, the Moon Temple. Um, but then uh, there was another one added on because villagers, after you know, the Moon Temple was relocated, that villagers were complaining that they were seeing spirits walking around, not very happy, because the Huanghuang uh, um, deity could no longer have a place to control these spirits. So, so after some negotiation, they built the Huanghuang Temple too, uh, next to it. And then, of course, at the out, out, so the outskirt of the village, then um, some of the more marginal villages said that, oh, the Tianhao, the Tinhao also needed uh, a place, and so there, so they accommodate. So they, all, the, all the temples were all together now. And then on top of it, um, you know, just in preparation for the Asian Games, um, some folks thought that it's very useful to build some uh, commercial shop fronts um, to somehow to become, for, for the village to become a tourist attraction and to to sort of uh, 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 to express the, the, the valuable Ningnan Wenhua, uh, the Ningma Manfa. But I was told that these architectural styles are really not Ningnan. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically the Gongji, uh, the, the Jiang, uh, Jiangsu area type of architecture. But it, uh, it looks old enough, so that. <laughs> so here they are. And so but then. When the, and when the houses were all built, when the uh, luxury apartments were all built, then they have to become nimble. It, it is a, it's, a, it's a steep learning curve. Um, the subways were moving in. So there come the urban tenants. So there they are. You know, these are the luxury apartments they have you know, with the Qitang, uh, Qitang tree right in front. And so now each family having a dozen or so of these uh, luxury apartments, um, they will live in a field and they have to rent out the rest because that is their only source of income, apart from the collective uh, village dividends that they still collect. Uh, but these will be their major sources of income. And so, but there's no uh, a real estate agent, right? And so they're sitting around in the village ground and just, you know, for a while, that's how they are trying to catch rent. They even put, uh, they put uh, for sale signs or uh, for rent signs, you know, on every tree they can, they can find in the village, you know, and, and leaving a cell phone. Because um, I think basically the villagers do not trust the, the real estate agents in town. And they thought they charged too much. But then, you know, with all these new speciality, you build, you know, you're testing new public spaces. And, um, and then you see the villagers differentiating among themselves too. So I'm gonna go, these are the last few photographs. Um, you know, um, at, at the intersections, you see late, you know, old ladies are sitting around, you know, looking to buy you know, scraps and whatever. And then they, have, they can't talk, you know, in sharing information about how to redo their apartments. You know, so they, they're hanging around public area um, to gossip. And then they are now even taking in foreign uh, um, uh, uh, renters. But now, if you go inside, how to adjust living in these huge 40-story buildings? I mean, one, I remember some of the villagers were complaining that the the thing that they are not, um, they are very, uh, 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 th that need adjust adjustment was riding the elevators, you know, and the height, I mean, it, it, the height was really a little scary, uh, and then they're just watching, and then sometimes, you know, they put their little style with them, you know, this, this will work well in Foreman with a very good friend, and she said, wow, my flat is so sunny, and so she continues to hang, you know, you know, to dry her, 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 her ritual pork and her, her chicken legs and whatever, and just hanging up, uh, 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 them out in the balcony. And, but, you know, for any real estate uh, agent, this is prime real estate. These apartments will be worth, worth, you know, 10 million or whatever, and then they were hanging up with you know, chicken legs. 
But then this is a very interesting picture. I have to show this, you know, in the, the, these last few, because we were walking around and and uh, and the villagers were showing us their new apartments. And these old folks were were good friends. And as they were walking past, one was sort of sneering at the other. Well, one of them, you know, was fortunate to, you know, by the lottery. He and his son got a very, very valuable one, facing you know, the river way up on top, and then the other didn't. And so the, the, the one in the white shirt was sort of sneering at the other, saying that, well, when you get out to the balcony, you know, be careful. <laughs> Watch out for the wind. It might just blow you off the balcony. And there it was. So you can see uh, 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 these um, uh, villages differentiating themselves. But then there's the homecoming. So I, uh, and I just want to sort of show these last few uh, um, uh, uh, slides for the homecoming, the, the, the village feast, reinforcing this village of, uh, organization. So that was, you know, we were there, we were invited to be uh, a guest, uh, a guest for them. So a lot of gongs and drums. And there was, there was this, as if it was a village ground, I mean, this was, these were roads, yeah, and um, then they were, yeah, you know, they block off all the roads, and then they were just like when they were uh, in the village before, and in the evening, it was a very happy occasion, there's 10,000 of them. Uh, um, there were like 1,100 anchor tables, so, and they cook for themselves, and this is not a dead body, this was an extremely exhausted cook at the end of the meal. Um, he was just taking a nap. And then this was the party secretary. He's obviously a billionaire. And he's been there for 24 years. And he was having many of those flats facing the river. <laughs> and he was one of our informants. He, he has quite a few too. And he's not, you know, he's very appreciative. He's not unhappy. But he has tremendous <coughs> ambivalence. What, what's the evidence? Um, you know, there's such generational fortunes. Because he said, you know, his generation is fine. They are retired. They have leisure. They are fine. They are secure. Uh, there's a huge lost generation that is, you know, a uh, generation from 35 years old to about 55. Those were people who were very much, uh, um, who, who grew up during the Maoist era, who's very rural, who have no urban skills to, to engage with an urban economy. And now they have money, but they have no future. So there's a young chin, old chin, new chin, new chin too. Um, um, and then, you know, but the generation of the, this one part is for the younger ones, you know, people who are still in school, you know, the grandparents' generation are now giving uh, these kids a lot of pressure because the future will be for the younger one. They have to skip the whole generation of what we for the last generation. And so at the end, you know, this is the last uh, slide. Um, it was in 2009, the bridge, actually, the, the, the bridge um, uh, right you know, cutting through the village um, was uh, was just opened uh, for uh, for for traffic, and um, some people were very very worried uh, because they thought that um, there's quite a bit of um, how would I say a bit of of um, a bit of misfortune in the village, and so what they did is that they dug out an old cannon left over in the in the Opium War days, and they, they aimed the cannon right against the bridge. And then they built this statue uh, of a very old general clad in armor, and uh, you can't see the sword, but it was you know, sort of pointing the sword also at the, at the, at the bridge. So I, I, sometimes I wonder whether that was the, the Chinese version of the uh, Don Gyalte, the Lamenta, <laughs> but I'm sure the Lili village villages would think otherwise. But here they are, 
This is the experience of an urban village and all the villagers turning themselves deliberately and consciously wrong, holding on to their collective real estate and trying to be open. So thank you very much. I think so. about what you think about the impact of local um, uh, government finances on some of these communities you're talking about. Um, Bonjo uh, officials have told me that they're intent on doubling revenue from land sales in, in 2013 to 48 billion by creating a lot more CBD. So obviously they're aiming at the high end, they're trying to create office buildings, they're trying to create high end uh, residential uh, properties. Does that, um, those forces uh, impact your view on these local communities? Yeah, I think actually um, this, this case that we follow is a test case for the government, for the Ojo uh, uh, municipality government, because they're trying to see if this works, because obviously they have uh, um, very concentrated um, villages and renters who are actually quite happy. The villages are taken care of for the rest of their, of their lives in, in many ways. I mean, if you think about these, uh, 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 luxury apartments, they can rent about at about 50 yuan per square meter. And if you think about a villager uh, family having 10 uh, average uh, 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 100 meter, then we're talking about 50,000 a month. Uh, and so, for you know, so it, it's a lot of income. So the villagers are very happy. The renters. You know, for most of these urban villages surrounding uh, these CBDs and to be engulfed by the CBDs, um, the, um, the renters outnumber the villagers almost 10 times in number. So, so there's a huge market for uh, uh, these very nice uh, 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 apartments for the rising Guangzhou uh, um, professionals. They're no longer catering to the foreign professionals, but for Guangzhou's own uh, professionals who are finding the, 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 these new environments better. So I have a feeling that um, the transformation of the Changbong film with this kind of model, it may not be as accurate as this one you know, for future, uh, because the government has learned uh, uh, that they cannot just, you know, cater to the villages in this kind of skyrocketing kind of compensation. But I think at least they would follow, uh, um, I, would, I would imagine, follow this, uh, um, this kind of model for a while to come. Uh, so I don't know how many CBDs they are trying to, to, to establish, but, uh, but Guangzhou is really quite a, a, um, an amazing city. You know? I mean, I don't know, maybe it's just because I, I I'm Cantonese or whatever, and I have special emotions for that place compared to what I see in, in Shanghai and Beijing. I just found Guangzhou a lot more comfortable because there's a huge, um, a, a growing commercial class and very huge middle class. Yeah. And, and, and yes, you do have uh, 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 um, social polarization, but there's a huge middle class growing rapidly. And so these kind of Plans, you know, for, for the municipal government will be catering to that kind of function. So it may not be a bad idea. I don't know, but I don't know policy. Communist, the communal past 
the common unit, the shi, shi yuan, as part of the identity contradict with this new, rich urban identity? Or if there's any kind of contradictions? Yes, yeah, see, see, the theme of my talk is precisely that, that tension. That, in, a, in fact, for decades, since 1958, these villages were kept poor, isolated, and grounded in this rural, unproductive land. And so, so in a sense, Mao promised them nothing. And instead, they, they promised them a very, very cellular, uh, 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 poor um, uh, 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 experience. And the, the, the interesting part is that because of the coming in of this kind of a market, <coughs> the fact that nationally, um, the government wants to urbanize, to modernize, um, to show the world and in, 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 in multiple forms. And suddenly, these land became very valuable because of this rapid revaluation of land. And so the, the villages are made, just like what um, the, 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 the Somia people, you know, a la Jim Scott. I mean, they are using, they are deliberately turning themselves raw by sticking to their land sticking to, uh, uh, together as a collective, uh, because that's the only way they can actually negotiate in, uh, in, in a big way with the developers. And mind you, all of these houses cannot be bought and sold. They remain collective, unless they can pay a huge sum to the city government to turn them, uh, uh, to pay a certain price to them, uh, uh, to then turn, turn them into some, some other kind of All these 37 blocks cannot be bought, in. so so it's not being circulated in the market. So unless they stick together, it's very it's very difficult to to maintain this kind of of, of growth. Um, do they derive the rents and the like the they get the rents from the Yeah, 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 they do now. I mean, we've been offered actually. My my team has been offered, you know, by some of the friends who said, well, look. Um, you know, if you rent this uh, 750 two-bedroom apartment, you know, for your for your field headquarters, well, it, it's going to cost you. Uh, now we'll give you a, a better price. Uh, <laughs> so, but uh, I, 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 I I couldn't even afford that. I have to say, uh, but uh, but it's um, yeah, they they are deliberately, you know, creating this kind of. A collectivity. That's why they need to put the town together. They need they, they put put the temples together. They they, just, they don't know. I mean, especially the younger generation. They know nothing about Chinese tradition. I mean, it's just putting them together and and reinventing them in order to reinforce this very uh, 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 collective. That's why I said, Jim, we found Sonia from just the CBD. How odd. But I haven't thought it through yet, but you know, I hope you to, to go further. What did the developers get out of doing these 37 blocks? Well, they got the rest of the village land. Right? So if you, for example, if you have, have village land like this, and then they got all of it, and then they built this, so the villagers got this, the developers got that. They, that's huge value. High-end malls, uh, other luxury apartments, and then the city was coordinated. They just built the, 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 the subway and all that, so increasingly this becomes the is slightly, not even suburb, it's still city center. And the developers, um, um, they're, they're, there's a developer actually, um, uh, which um, which became, becomes partner to the village to build luxury hotel. And so it will be a joint ownership. And so the so hotels, malls, and so that's what we do. It's really pleasant. Yes, I've got a kind of political science -y question. Oh. 
you've, you've been referring to the villagers and them, but then it came out that the party secretary was a billionaire. So I wonder about the decision-making process for this. Because uh, certainly the kinds of um, stories that we read about, the more popular stories, about, are about local leaders, you know, exploiting the people with the land, taking the land and doing deals with uh, developers. So why didn't that happen in this case? I mean, what, what, what makes this case so unusual? And then the second, the second observation I have is that I guess sociology would tell us that high density living is disastrous for community. So community is going to collapse because of this in spite of the little temples. And that land itself will become so valuable that that will have to be redeveloped into, into whatever. So high density living is a disaster for community. So two issues. Yeah. Well, let's go to the first one. You know, the party secretary have been, has been the party secretary there for 24 years, and he's still what people call the Zhang Sao Jie team, right? He's, he's covering the sky with the sing, you know, single-handedly covering of the sky. So actually, even before the villagers got back their, their apartments, um, the deals between the government, some of the government officials and him, I mean, there's already rumors. I have no proof because I couldn't even get to, of course, get to some of these. Um, but uh, there were rumors that there's already quite a bit of deal that the, the village was getting far lower uh, in, in, in compensation than what they could have gotten. But most of it went to the pocket of the Swiss bank account of, of these villages. So, so even without those uh, apartments, and we even see others, um, 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 not just the party secretary, but also the entire village leadership. So their families tend to probably get you know, some other deals that we would know. It's just rumors. So in a sense, the village um, uh, leadership structure is still very similar. Because the, the party secretary was able to control the recruitment and the appointment of the, of the, of the they still call them sometimes the job. They still call them the, the, the team leaders. Uh, but in fact, the, this is the village leadership group. Now they are all members now of the shareholding company, so they manage the collective uh, 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 properties, whatever remaining. Um, and and so they get. Uh, um, so there's definitely a clique of of, of uh, village leaders who are considered untouchable. Um, but at the same time, I see less, you know, I don't see huge collective resistance, you know, just you know, sort of nasty rumors here and there. Um, because if you take the fortunes of each of these families, I mean, there's 16, uh, there's 16 uh, uh, hundred plus households in this village, uh, total 4,000 some villages together. Um, and each family, they are multi-millionaires too, right? If I have 10 flats, each of them worth now, I would say, five, six million market price, even though they can't sell them at this point, but in future, who knows, right? Um, and then even renting, they can get, uh, uh, um, you know, so 50,000 a month, and um, you know, so, so in a sense, they are quite happy, even though they know that the party secretaries who, you know, benefiting a lot more than that. That's why they divide the, the whole area, the 37 blocks, into the Fu Ren Xu and the Chong Ren you know? They call themselves, you know, all those, you know, leadership people have, you know, live in the rich man's area, and then the ordinary villages are the poor men, but they are not poor at all. Right. So the second 
Your second question. It's just an observation about density yeah. and community. I think yes. high density destroys community. Yes, in a sense, they, they are still making efforts, um, even though the, the biggest complaint is that now they, they can't just walk next door and then say, hey, because it can be you know, an African trader. They <laughs> always stop their neighbor. So cell phones is extremely important. And then they still would make uh, like weddings and others. Um, quite a few of the weddings still take place in the Tietang. And so those are additional occasions to come back together. A very uh, a good case to, 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 to illustrate your point is the fate of the village school. See, when the whole village was uh, uh, demolished, the village school was moved elsewhere for uh, a, couple, uh, a few years. And then there's allocation for the new village school to be built right back within the 37 blocks. Well, the Secretary, the party secretary, you know, made a suggestion uh, last year, saying that well, look, we've negotiated slots for our children to go into uh, 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 into the city school districts, good ones. So allocation of of city uh, 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 school slots. I mean, in the past, everybody would jump at the chance, right? I mean, it's so you know, it, it, it's such a social mobility. Well, the villagers resisted, and quite a few hundred actually protested in front of the village office, saying that they want the village school because they want their children to stick together and remember their collective identity. So it, it seems very counterintuitive and inward-looking, but I, I believe that that's, there's two things there. First, you know, the villagers do not want that piece of village land to be sold and that most of the profit being corrupted away. Secondly, um, I think they, they still would want to remain corrupted. So that's a good example to show their sort of contradictory emotions right now. Can I uh, follow up on John's question about the community, which I think is uh, very interesting. And I, I, I thank you for, for the talk, which is very thought provoking as well. Um, in, in this particular case, you also alluded to the issues about Hukou and also the notion of polarization. And very much, you know, on these uh, school issues, that um, access to societal resources, welfare, education, and the rest of it makes a very fine, uh, very, very uh, clear distinctions between those who have Hukou and those who have not. And in this particular case, um, we understand at the end of your presentation, this is actually a uh, leader village which has undergone a very significant process of transformation, partly attributed to the fact of the uh, technology development. My, my sort of first question is related to this is that, but for the fact of the location of this village, this will not be a celebrated success, so to speak, which draws attention for a lot of uh, research uh, related to, to, to these issues. So what is the lesson to be learned by the other Hundred plus village cities in the region, and then uh, related to this is going to be again what you related to it from the outset about this uh, very entrepreneurial spirit of the party sector. <coughs> Say, for example, in the case of uh, uh, Shenzhen, we have the Sha Sha village, which emulate very similar process of changes and transformation, precisely because of the what I call the leadership or the uh, very enterprising spirit of the uh, party sector. So how and in what way that brings into this process of changes and transformation? I think you're right. I mean, the, the leadership structure is very important. The unity of the villages behind the party secretary is very important. I think for this case, it was very clear that um, they, they were acting in unison. I mean, I don't think there were huge protests and, and all that and, fa and factional fights within the leadership as much as some of the surrounding ones. Um, so I, I, I think leadership is it's, it's, it, it, it's crucial. Uh, but location, I don't think this village is particularly advantageous as a location. There are other better ones. But then, you know, other situations will let it happen. Uh, this
this one was negotiated before the financial tsunami. I think that makes a lot of difference too. So I mean, there are historical reasons why this work and is not going to be repeated. Because I think the government also realized that the villages are now using the, their land as a milk cow, they call it. And so, uh, because quite a few of, of, of the surrounding villages are already building all sorts of illegal structures on their existing old houses in order to maximize their the compensation area. Um, so, so a lot of this, I mean, but, but this village was being watched very closely as what can be emulated and what cannot. So, um, but this is just one case. Like a young tea nowadays, there are lots of resistance to that. So I, I'm just wondering how political, how shaped is this uh, the, the, the development of that building? I mean, how Because I, I'm wondering how politi how this, this case is uh, very special because uh, of a political issue, political pressure for the Asian game. Of course, every case would be unique, right, because of the different historical factors that add together. Um, but, but on the other hand, compared to other urban villages, that there's a, another level of abstraction that they would share. Because you're still talking about two very different property ownership or property use systems here. Uh, actually, the case was actually you know, when I first talked about these Changchun uh, back in 2003 at Yale, in the Yale Law School, um, a political science colleague of mine, Pierre Landry, uh, uh, he asked me, uh, saying that, well, look, Helen, if these villages uh, uh, become absorbed by the city, then, then the Changchun issue will be over. And I said, no, it won't. So long as the collective property and the state property uh, uh, divisions are still there, uh, then as cities expand, you have one ring of urban villages being absorbed and then turned into you know, varying successes of these of this case. Uh, but then, then it opens up another ring, you know, further uh, into the rural areas. So so long as as cities expand into collective rural land, and these kind of issues will continue. So, um, so at one level, you know, really it is special, but on at another level, it's not. Uh, uh, I have a question about sort of the legal status of, of uh, how this works. Because um, it seems like from what you're saying that that the village still exists and there's no Google attached to this village, right? Um, and people are allocated, were allocated uh, apartments at the time of plantation. So let's say an old couple uh, who were uh, Google holders and who were allocated, say, 10 apartments, they died and they have no heirs. Then what happened to the apartments? And, and, and if their heirs, say, don't have Google of the village but have Google belonging to the city, like, let's say they, they actually bought, 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 bought no people rather than village people, then, then are, they, were they still, are they still eligible for, for the apartment? Can they inherit it? I mean, how, how does that work down the line? I mean, it's fine now when they're all alive and it's pretty new, but I can see how in a few years uh, problems will start happening. Right? Then, then what happens? Yeah, well, it came in stages. In 1994, um, the village collective actually stabilized the number of Huko within the village. That is, um, they were set, you know, whatever at the time that they put a stop to it. You know, any more additions, there's no more uh, 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 shares. Um, and then, you know, um, so uh, uh, if you, you know, so how would they, what's the word they use? Um, whatever increases 
uh, um, it won't increase the shares, whatever decreases, it won't decrease the shares. That means uh, whoever died, you know, so long as they have uh, um, given uh, by will or whatever, uh, rich, you know, given the, the property to their heirs, then the heirs would, would succeed. Um, so by, by that time, you know, in, in 1994, um, uh, uh, no, not, sorry, in, in, in 1994, that's when most of their village land was given to the city uh, for compensation. Uh, but in 2000, all the villages were given urban statuses. They are still villages, but they are urban. In the, in the eyes of the law, in the eyes of the government, they are urban residents. They can look for work in the cities, and they can. The, the children then go to urban schools. It's just that you know, not many of them were competitive. Um, but in a sense, the hookah is already urban. Um, so then, the properties they have now are very much, you know, guarded, guided by uh, um, state laws governing urban properties rather than rural land. And so inheritance, divorce, you know. And the problem is with the laws itself. If you look at some of the laws being passed in 2008-2009 on how to, how to deal with um, uh, uh, um, property ownership, um, it's still not resolved. I mean, women is particularly an issue because a lot of these who call and property is registered required to register now legally, uh, but you know, in the name of the representative of the household. So when it comes to divorce, the women are the ones to lose out of the property division. So it's still not worked out yet. We should ask Robert to, to give them some, some, <laughs> some legal advice as to how to make the law a little bit fairer, gender. But I, I don't know how it's going to work out yet, but this will be fun to, to find out. You know. But you need macro laws and regulations to change first before it can be locally uh, implemented in its varied ways. I see that there's a lot of interest in, in, in Helen's fascinating topic, very complex and very interesting. Um, but I'm sure she will give us another talk when she, she hears her at the, 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 the end of, of the research, maybe next year when she comes for a year. Yeah. So, um, and, and also today we about Africa. Yes. <laughs> uh, I will make uh, Helen work for more than one and a half hours already, so we should let her take a rest because she just arrived two days ago. So thank you very much, Helen, for this wonderful talk. And